For the remainder of August, we'll be looking at the last three stained glass windows from our chapel series, Windows on the Word. These three windows are all related to the theme of connecting, the vertical connection to God, which then leads to the horizontal connection to neighbor, especially the stranger. We are going to be reminded again and again of how Jesus meets us right where we are and often in ways we don't expect. This mini-series is called Groping for God. And we have a memory verse for the month of August, and you'll find it on page 8 of your bulletin. Grope for God and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. The chapel window for today, which is on the cover of your bulletin, depicts the scene of the last of the supper in Emmaus. Jesus is blessing the bread, and suddenly the disciples' eyes are opened and they recognize him. The symbols in the upper window are the grapes and the shock of wheat, representing, of course, the wine and the bread of the Lord's Supper. This story is only found in the Gospel of Luke, and you'll find it in the 24th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Hear now the word of God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in those days? Jesus asked him, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered there. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples told what had happened on the road, and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord, to hear and see you in the scriptures that are read and proclaimed today. In your holy name we pray, 
Amen. Have you ever been so lost in thought that you didn't notice anything or anyone around you? I have experienced this when I'm driving, hopefully not in a dangerous way, but in a not paying attention to the details kind of way. Friends have told me that they have waved to me as their cars passed by, but I didn't respond. I saw the car, of course, but I'm not paying attention to the details. To be fair, when I'm driving, I am often thinking, or listening to a podcast, or catching up with one of my daughters on my hands-free phone. And I am not expecting to see a friend beside me, behind me, or in front of me. Expectations seem to play a huge role in what we experience. If you expect to see a friend, you would be looking for her. And if you expect to have a great day, you often do, even when things come at you that are unplanned or unwelcomed. Sadly, if you expect to be disappointed, that too often comes to pass. You've heard of the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Expectations affect how we think, feel, and behave. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus did not expect to encounter, encounter the living Lord. In fact, they said, we had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah, the one to redeem us all. But now, now Jesus is dead and we're going home. They had lost a friend. They had lost a savior. They had lost hope. These men were deep in grief. And honestly, those who are grieving really deserve a break. In his book, Lament for a Son, Nicholas Wolterstorff wrote about the death of his 25-year-old son, Eric, from a hiking accident in the mountains of Austria. Walter Stoff laments how he had taken Eric for granted. He wrote, perhaps we all take each other too much for granted. The routines of life distract us. Our own pursuits make us oblivious. Our anxieties and sorrows unmindful. The beauties of the familiar go unremarked. We do not treasure each other enough. As the outpouring of letters arrived expressing their gratitude and appreciation for Eric, Wolterstorff wept, and he wondered how he could be thankful for the life of his son when the loss was so excruciating. He wrote, the pain of no more outweighs the gratitude of the once was. The pain of no more outweighs the gratitude of, once, of, of the once was. The heaviness and darkness of grief is disorienting and isolating. The griever is isolated from the happy person and from the other person who is also grieving because we each grieve differently and yet on the road to Emmaus, we learn that Jesus meets us right where we are, which tells us we should be groping for God, even in our grief and in our disappointment. Did you read about the Dutch cyclist Annemiek van Vluten, who crossed the finish line with her arms raised high in victory, thinking she had won the Olympic gold medal after a grueling 85-mile bicycle race? She later found out that although Kiesenhofer was nowhere in sight, Austrian Anna Kiesenhofer had already beaten her to the finish line. A disappointed van Vluten said, I thought... I had won. I am gutted about this. We had hoped. You fill in the blank. We had hoped that the pandemic would be over by now, not resurging and putting at risk health care providers and others whom we love, not to mention the fear of being locked down again into social isolation. 
we had hoped that the diagnosis would not be cancer, that her memory would return. We had hoped that he would have gone to counseling and not taken his life that she would have not been on the road the night of that accident, that the building wouldn't collapse. We had hoped, and now here we are, groping for God. A pastor speaking to women prisoners in a correctional facility said, faith in God doesn't produce cheerful optimism. It produces a gritty, defiant hope that God is still writing the story and that despite the darkness, a light still shines and that God can redeem us and that beauty matters and that despite every disappointing thing we have ever done or endured, that there is no hell from which resurrection is impossible. Hope is not the starting point. Suffering is. Friends, it is a suffering God whom we worship. It is a suffering Jesus who meets us where we are and often where we least expect him. But do we notice him? Do you realize that God is in this present moment? God is always in the moment, regardless of whether it's easy or hard, joyful or painful. In his book, Dangerous Wonder, Michael Iaconelli wrote about a time when he had an opportunity to spend a week with the great Henry Nouwen, who was a priest, professor, and author of 39 books on the spiritual life. Nouwen left academia and spent the last 11 years of his life as a pastor and a caregiver in a community home for people with developmental disabilities. Mike was delighted to learn that Nowen would be presiding over the Lord's Supper for his study group. It turned out that Deb would be receiving her first communion. Deb's 25-year-old body was ravaged by cerebral palsy and was as cooperative as a limp rag doll. Unable to speak, unable to respond, she had to be held by someone at all times. Well, the big day arrived. Mike had come with the expectation that this could be a great experience in the presence of God. Deb was in a fully restrained wheelchair, her face radiant, her hair beautifully done, her dress stunning. 60 other mentally and physically challenged members of the community were there, along with two dozen workers and Mike's study group. The room was crowded and noisy. As the Eucharist began, Mike's heart sank in disappointment. Mike wrote, the noise was chaotic and distracting. Those with Down syndrome were humming loudly, continually rocking back and forth to a rhythm that only they could hear. One girl would suddenly let loose with an ear-piercing -pier shriek every few seconds, and the service had to be stopped temporarily because one member of the community had an epileptic seizure. He wrote, I was completely distracted, disappointed at the chaos and confusion that had ruined my experience of God. As Father Nowen presented the body and blood of Christ to each person in that room, I was secretly pouting, secretly counting the minutes until I could leave. Mike continued, when Father Nowen stepped in front of Deb, her body stopped jerking and moving out of control. Her eyes glistened, her mouth opened to receive the wine and the bread, and then ever so slightly, I saw her smile. At once, the noise in the room was transformed into what I imagined the noise at the nativity would have been like. God was there. His fragrance filled the room. Deb, 
the girl who could do nothing, the girl who would never give a talk, the girl who would never dance, the girl who would never write a book or play the piano or sing a song taught me about the grace of God. God is in our grief. God is in our disappointment and in our experiences of the pandemic and most certainly in our broken lives. And I wonder, when does faith become sight? For the two men on the road to Emmaus, they saw Jesus in the breaking of the bread. As Jesus blessed, broke, and gave the bread of life, their eyes were opened. Speaking of eyes, did you know that God made flounders just like other normal fish, swimming upright with one eye on each side of their face? Then, in preparation for adult life, flounders undergo a bizarre transformation. One eye migrates to the other side of their head. It's like facial reconstructive surgery, only in slow motion without scalpels or sutures. If God can help the flounder see with these awesome binocular eyes in such a miraculous way, imagine what God can do for you and for me. And I wonder, what would it take for us to see Jesus, to trust, to truly trust that God is Emmanuel, God with us wherever, whatever we are doing, wherever we are going. Perhaps then we would grope for God in our grief, in our disappointment, and even in our ordinary moments. We all want to connect with Jesus. We want what Jesus offers, the peace that passes all understanding, the love and grace to pour onto us so much that it overflows to everyone we meet. Can you imagine if we all were able to recognize God in our midst? For in God, we live and move and have our being. Will you pray with me? God of the flounders, fill our hearts with anticipation and expectation to encounter you on our road to Emmaus. Guide us on the path toward our destination and renew our strength as we continue to walk and commune with you. Open our eyes so we may see the signs of your presence around us. Open our hearts so we may receive your peace and love and empower us to pass on to others the grace you have shared with us so freely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.